Hi, everybody. It's Dr. Lori. This is Ask Dr. Lori Live. It's nice to be with all of you. I'm taking your questions. Where do you put your questions? Type them into the comments. And I, of course, will answer those questions. We'll choose them and answer them and make the questions, of course, you know, questions that will help everybody. So I'm taking your questions. I will answer any questions. Is she going to answer personal questions? Yeah, I'll answer personal questions. Go ahead. Ask me your questions. And any questions, of course, about art antiques and collectibles and values. A um, couple of things. Don't forget about the newsletter. That's right. You know where the newsletter is. You go to drlaurieV.com, put in your email address. And then, of course, we send the newsletter out to you. Subscribe to the newsletter. It's with the thumbs up free icon right there at the website. Just put in your email. And the next newsletter is going to talk about the list of vintage clothing sites and shops online that you can find where you can find deals on vintage clothing. So I've created a list for you. I know you love my lists. That's why I'm doing the list, making it easy for you at drlaurieV.com. Don't forget to get the newsletter. You can sign up there, subscribe for it. Okay. Well, my, my of course, all of you are going to ask some questions and see what you've got. Cynthia, is Murano glass jewelry valuable? Okay, Murano, and uh, remember, Murano glass jewelry is valuable. It's pretty expensive and pricey if you buy it in Venice, in Murano, in fact. And a couple of different things. So the jewelry comes in all different types. Most of them are those millefior beads. Sometimes they're beads with um, their, their, what do you look for in Murano glass jewelry? Here's what you look for. You look for millefior beads. That's, of course, those very valuable, beautiful, uh, rods that are blown glass rods, those beads, millefior, millefiori. Some of you like to have me pronounce that last, um, that last sound, millefiori beads. Um, the other thing that you're looking for are beads, which have, of course, a metallic. Sometimes they have gold flecks in them. Those can be valuable, those beads. There's also pendants that are, per that are uh, available for purchase from Murano, uh, bracelets, uh, all different types of pieces of glass jewelry. And yes, they hold their value very well. So that's a good question. That's the kind of question that everybody can learn from. So I like that kind of question. So you're looking for uh, the gold flex in the, in the blown glass. You're looking for millefiori beads. You're looking for necklaces, pendants, bracelets, earrings. They have all different ones. Sometimes they're little figural ones like little fi uh, figures of fish or little figures of birds. Those kinds of things are pretty typical too. What about Pandora beads marked Murano? Okay, well, Pandora has beads, and sometimes those Pandora beads are, in fact, like black glass, right? Or maybe they'll be black and white glass or a colored glass that goes along with, you know, when you're building your, your Pandora bracelets. Um, and sometimes those are set within sterling silver or even gold, but typically in sterling silver. So, yeah, if they're marked Murano, you want to make sure that you have those marks and you want to look for the precious metals that they're being set in, like uh, sterling silver, for example. So, yeah. What about Pandora beads, Mark Murano? I'm assuming that this question really means, are they valuable? And the answer to that is, yes, they're valuable. When you're looking for any Pandora beads, I want you to look for details. So you've got a Pandora bracelet or you're building a Pandora bracelet over time. I want you to look for details. So whatever it might be, if you're if you like the... Um, like my Pandora bracelet, for example, has a, a couple of things like there's a queen bee on my Pandora bracelet and there's a, a mountain of books and the books are act for studying for students. And the, um, the books actually have a lot of details in it. You can actually see what the titles of the books are. So details for Pandora beads. And if you are, if you're doing the classic Pandora, which started out to be sterling silver and then later they got into gold, um, you might be looking for, in fact, some of the glass Murano united with, of course, the typical Pandora bead style. And remember, Pandora beads have that screw element, and then some of them just slide right on. Some of them actually are um, hinged so they can stop the other ones. So, you know, there's a lot of thought going into Pandora when they were making those pieces. And a lot, a lot of people actually, you know, use them as the 21st century charm bracelets. So um, I think they're nice. You want to make sure that you're looking for details when it comes to Pandora, marks when it comes to Pandora. This is your list. And of course, precious metals, gold, silver, and such. So good question. Thank you. Anne, hi, Anne. Is there a difference in value for a cameo if it's facing left? No, no. Uh, cameos can, can be in profile. It doesn't necessarily have to be left or right. There are a lot of people who will talk about, oh, if it's left, it means this. Oh, if it's right, it, mean, it means that. It depends on the actual cameo. 
Uh, there's a couple of things with respect to that. Some cameos, some of the most valuable ones actually are not in profile and are figures of cla our classical figures, like whole scenes, as opposed to just a figure, usually of a woman looking left or right. But again, it doesn't have to be one way or another. There are a lot of people who will sort of perpetuate these myths, but that is not an indicator of value. Here's an indicate. Here are indicators of values for cameos. What do you look for? You look for the carving. You look for the carving to be very highly detailed. You look for, of course, um, the consistency of the color of the shell. You're looking for contrast in those shell cameos that are carved. Italian cameos are usually better cameos in terms of quality. We've seen that over the centuries. An American cameo next to an Italian cameo, the Italian one is usually, of course, carved better in many cases. Um, the other thing that you want to think about is you want to think about, of course, size of the cameo, the intricacy of the carving, and what scene is on the carving. Is it a classical scene? Is it, you know... Um, uh, a gladiator in a chariot, you know, what might it be? And is it set in sterling silver or 14 karat gold or such? So what to look for in that list, there it is for cameos. And there's more information, of course, about cameos and many of my other videos. So if you haven't checked out the binge link, which is easy to find on the website specials and shop page, you got to scroll down and the binge link will help you, in fact, to learn more and to look for cameos. So you can always go to the website, and just put in the search cameos. So there's the binge link from the specials and shop page at drlaurieV.com. It's easy to use. Take that little link, it's right there, click on it and then save it, bookmark it to your browser. Bookmark it so you can go back to it. It, may, it organizes everything and the most recent videos come up first. And that's a lot easier for a lot of people who are looking for videos. Or if you wanna search the website, you can do that too, whichever you like. But yeah, cameos, good question. What happened to Kermit the Frog? Kermit the Frog is always with me in spirit, Lori. <laughs> Kermit the Frog is, is always with me in spirit. Um, again, a lot of people collect those Muppets, right? The Sesame Street characters. And Kermit the Frog is, of course, one that holds its value in many different ways. It doesn't necessarily have to be, of course, just the Kermit the Frog stuffed animal that I've had on the set for many different times. We change out the studio set and Kermit the Frog appears. Um, but also in many other different forms. So it might be stuffed dolls, it might be ceramic pieces, it might be, you know, um, albums, right? Uh, record albums, all different types of things. So good question, good question. I'm glad that you're watching. And of course, if you've been watching, um, you know that I talk about all different pieces, all different types of pieces that appear on my table. I talk about eventually, of course, in the, um, in the videos. Are retired pieces of jewelry worth more? I have a retired James Avery design. Well, typically when they're retired, they're more difficult to obtain. So of course they're not producing the same thing. So value can change. Now, I didn't say they're worth more necessarily, more than what? Are they worth more than the same designer's may, um, piece that is not retired? That's up to the designer, but typically when they retire a design, they typically will in fact um, impact that will impact the value because most collectors are saying, I can't get another one just like it. I can't just go to the firm and say, I want another one from this particular design line. So typically if they're more difficult to obtain, um, this is not the same. And I want to make this clear. This is not the same as when an artist dies. Okay. People go, Oh, but the artist died. Uh, it's not the same thing. When a piece is retired from a particular designer, it's more difficult to obtain it because now what you have to do is you have to find somebody who has that one and you have to, hopefully they want to sell it to you. So yeah, if you have a retired piece, it can be valuable. Yes. But J um, those particular James Avery designs that are not retired are valuable too. So first you have to establish that. Thank you very much for the super chats and super stickers. Those of you who are supporting me and supporting the channel and doing that, I appreciate it. And all everybody else who's watching, you're helping all those people too. So, you know, I always say share the load because everybody, when one person does that to help me to do, make more videos, you know, it helps everybody else. So I appreciate everybody doing whatever they can, watching, sharing, and of course, super chats and super stickers. So there's lots going on, lots happening here. It's been very, very busy. And this is a busy time of year typically. Um, and some people are saying, really, you know, this is a busy time of year for for the, what I do, it's a busy time of year. People are getting themselves organized. You know, this is an organizational time of year. So, um, and I also do a lot of fun stuff too. So 
fun things that I do, for example, and maybe you've seen my Facebook page or my Instagram feed or, you know, I mean, I was taking a little break. I had a, a mud mask facial that I shared the other day, actually, before uh, before I hit the hay one, one night. It was, a, it was really a lot of fun. So if you haven't gone over to the Facebook page or if you missed some of the fun things that um, show up with respect to my story here on um on YouTube or my Facebook page or my Instagram or other social media, check them out. I'd love to see you there too. How do you value turquoise and determine its quality? Okay, a couple of things about turquoise. There's a lot of fake or composite turquoise, things that look like turquoise, but they aren't the real thing. So it depends on what type of turquoise you're looking for. So you have to learn the different types, okay? So there are different types of turquoise from different lines, right? And you have to realize that they're going to have different properties. They're going to look different. Some are going to have a lot of veins. Some are going to be only teal color, very, very turquoise in color only with no veins. Some of them, of course, will have a, a more of a hardness, some a little softer, larger, smaller, how they're set into pieces of jewelry or if they're used for other things. So when you're looking at turquoise, there's lots of factors that you have to that come into play. If you're just looking for, oh, I have a squash blossom necklace and I, I want to know whether or not this is actual turquoise, then of course there's, it's a visual thing. You have to look at them and say, all right, this looks like it's from this particular Kingman mine or it's a Bisbee piece of turquoise or whatever it might be. And you have to look at those characteristics. You also have to look at size. You also have to look at shape. How is it actually applied? And is it natural turquoise? And how big is it in a particular, I'm gonna say piece of jewelry, assuming that that's what you're looking for. So there's a lot to look for when it comes, for tur comes to turquoise. And within those types of turquoise, there are different characteristics that you look for. Oh, so if you're looking at one type of turquoise in a Native American piece of jewelry, that might that will have different factors or a different list of what you look for than another. It's a good idea. Maybe it's something that I should put into a, an article for you. Make it made, the way I made it easy for you know gold and silver marks. What do you look for in this type of tur this type of turquoise, that type of turquoise, and so on and so forth. Um, and yes, the ones about marks are also on the website. Are pearls measured in carats? Pearls are measured with a caliper in millimeters. So larger, smaller. So remember a caliper? I remember when in the old days with weight loss, <laughs> I'll go back to the old days. You know, there's a caliper for like basically your fat arm or my fat arm. And basically calipers will tell you that idea of how large they are. So, and there's actually a pearl caliper that, that we've actually suggested too. But pearls me measured in millimeters, so you can have a small, like a four millimeter. You can have a seed pearl, very, very small. Or you can have like a four millimeter small pearl, and then you can have large ones. Um, I remember um, being in the, uh, in the South Pacific and seeing South Sea pearls that were as much as 16 to 18 millimeters. Really big pearls, really big ones. Um, but yeah, so that's how they're measured. Carrot weight, remember, carrots is, is fineness with a K and carrots are weight, right? So fineness with a K is, is one type of carrot. The carrots that you're thinking of with a C relates to carrot weight. And usually that's for diamonds, gemstones, faceted cut stones for the most part. Um, but pearls, no, they're not measured in carrots. What's meant by an item being a book item? Okay, a couple of different things. A lot of people will look for them. In art history, when it comes to art, Something that's a book item relates to that idea of it being part of a catalog raisonné for an artist. So if an artist, in fact, if it's in the book, that indicates that it has been identified as one of the pieces that was with the artist of, which is the French word for a career work. So that idea of having something that's within the book or within the catalog raisonné in art history, painters, sculptors, architects, whoever it might be, that's what you're looking at. Designers, that's typically what a book item means if it's in the catalog raisonné, which is kind of the tome, right? Like uh, the Bible for any particular artist, right? One of the books I wrote was about a particular artist and his career work. So catalog raisonnés are done over decades and decades, usually by more than one scholar. And uh, they are trying to document every piece that a work that an artist has done throughout his whole work. So uh, typically called a catalog raisonné. Some people refer to it as a book. Um, yeah, good question. Good question. There's lots of things that you think about when you're looking at value with respect to those types of things. A lot of people like to make sure and like to check the book um, in terms of 
being certain that an artist, that a work is actually falls within an artist catalog raisonne. Um, so if you're looking at pieces, and this is when it's a big discovery when they find a new piece. You know, I, I made a big discovery of a particular work by a very famous artist um, through an appraisal, and people are very, very surprised when a new piece comes up, um, onto the onto the um, onto the you know comes up above. How much is the value reduced when there is a small chip in Roseville Pottery? It depends on what small is, right? So anytime that you have a, an inclusion, a chip, a crack, a, any kind of problem, anything that's wrong, a glaze skip um, where the glaze didn't make it onto the actual piece of pottery, that will impact value. So how do we measure the length of a necklace? Okay, well, I have a necklace, I have a necklace on, I have a necklace on right here. Here's a necklace. I'm going to show you all this right now because you know what? A lot of you don't do this right. Um, and this is a very good question. It could help everybody. So here's my necklace, right? You notice I took it off. I didn't measure it on, right? From end to end, from this end with the clasp to this end with the clasp. Measure with, you know, I don't care what you use, uh, measuring tape, a ruler, your fingers, but in inches, right? And it will tell you, this is a 20 inch necklace. Why do I know? I know it from where it falls, but basically from end to end is how you ne measure a necklace. Now there are people that, that's not how you measure. You put it this way and then you do how you go half when it's on and then you double it. Well, that's not going to give you an accurate measurement. So lay it down. You know, I would say lay it down on the table and then put it, put it next to it. Don't hold the piece up and try to do it. Lay it down on a table and then put the measuring tape next to it, not on top of it. Why? What's the difference? You might be off by a little. And there are standard sizes. So, you know, the 18 to 20 inch thing, that's what you're typically going to see for most necklaces that hang like right about where this necklace is, where the other one is. But that's what you're basically looking at. Good question. Thank you. It'll help everybody. But you got to open up that necklace, unlatch it from the clasp and end to end, include the clasp. Are items that were sold as collector items, Hamilton dolls, worth holding on to, or would they be dumpster? Um, a couple of different things. First of all, collector's items, or would they be dumpsters? Um, if it has to say it's a collect, if, if it has to say it's a collector item or it's collectible, you know, it's probably if that to tell you that it's collectible, it probably isn't that everybody's saying, "Oh, I have to hold on to it." You know, um, a lot of things sort of become collectible over time. What does that mean? Uh, Beanie Babies are a good example. Beanie Babies actually became a collectible. They were marketed as a collectible in addition to them being a toy. So when a doll says, oh, these are collectible dolls, right? Anything's collectible, collect it. If you collect enough of them, anything's collectible. You know, whether it's teddy bears or rings or, or jewelry or dolls or whatever it is. Are they worth holding on to? It depends on whether or not enough people have in fact decided to collect these pieces. Just because the manufacturer wants to market them as collectible doesn't mean that people take on that and say, oh, yay, I think the marketer's right. I'm going to start collecting it. You know, sometimes pieces just become collectibles because everybody tends to like it or it relates to history. So are they worth holding on to? They could be. Um, in this particular case, your examples, both those examples I would hold on to for value down the road. What if there's an extension on the necklace? Well, Deborah, then what you do is you measure the necklace without the extension. You measure the extension, and when you list it or discuss it or you want to document it for yourself, you say, I have a 18-inch necklace with a 3-inch extension because that extension can actually be put onto a different necklace. So it doesn't necessarily go with that original necklace if it's an extension. Does that help? I hope that helps. Thank you very much for your super chats and super stickers. It helps everybody. And I appreciate that. And those of you, you know, you're a great community because those of you want to help each other, which I think is great, which I think is great. So I appreciate you doing that. And of course, you know, your, your colleagues appreciate it too. Your fellow watchers, followers and such appreciate it too. And speaking of fellow watchers and followers and such, do you have a particular YouTube, you know, um, another channel that you like that you're saying, you know what? That person would benefit from collaborating with Dr. Lori. That person and Dr. Lori would be great. I like to watch that particular channel. And I want to, in fact, I think Dr. Lori could help with helping them how to identify something, right? Or looking at their house if they're doing DIY. Uh, we did a great collaboration with Drew Scott of Lone Fox. And I was appraising, of course, his new house full of old uh, lighting fixtures. That was a lot of fun. 
So others, if you have an idea and you say, oh, I'd like to suggest this, suggest it, put it in the comments. We'll take it under advisement. You know, we want to make sure that we have those collaborations with all of those folks that you enjoy as well. And if those of you are saying, oh, people are decluttering, you could help. I was watching, I, you know, I watch a lot of other channels too. And one of the uh, other channels was going around, you know, a particular outdoor flea market. And I'm sitting there going, oh my gosh, pick this up, pick this up, pick this up. Walked right by it. She walked right by it. I'm going, oh, I could have helped her, you know? So um, anyway, if you want to, in fact, uh, suggest some collaborative projects for us, we're happy to, to listen. Thanks for your questions. Keep them coming. Get typing. Here's pastor. Here's the pastor. Why is the autograph backwards? H pastoral. H pastoral. I don't know which autograph you're talking about, honey. If you're talking about, uh, I'm going to guess, but I'm not sure if you want to, if you want to clarify for me, then I can answer your question specifically. But sometimes in prints, you will see an autograph that is backwards, or basically you'll see where the artist in the plate wrote something. This is pretty typical for Rembrandt, for example. So wrote Rembrandt, but it comes out in the reverse. That's not uncommon for, of course, um, pieces that are etched in the plate and then reprinted. So, okay, thanks for that question. Um, autographs being backwards on, I'm trying to think other examples of what an autograph would be backwards. Well, you'll have to explain it and then maybe I'll be able to answer it for you. Um, other questions, I'm happy to field your questions. Art Antiques are collectibles. I had some great, great video calls today. I met some wonderful people, lovely couples, people who were cleaning out mom's estate, people who were just trying to figure out if they had something valuable, people who in fact uh, might be featured on Real Bargains too. What's the difference between Kutani and Satsuma Japanese porcelain? I have vintage sleeping cat and it's beautiful, almost looks like Chloe's name. Okay, you got a lot of things happening here. <laughs> Kutani ware, in fact, I discuss on our website, Kutani ware is a particular, they're all particular designs of Japanese porcelain, right? Satsuma typically is characterized by, I'll give you a three for each. Satsuma is characterized usually by figures, um, gold, uh, hand-painted, this is Satsuma, Japanese Satsuma porcelain. Figures, usually figures, geishas, sometimes they're scholars, but figures on the actual piece of porcelain. Uh, golden details, highly decorative, and moriage. That's that wet slipware that I talk about. Kutani wear is oftentimes um, small flowers, details, hand-painted, as well as you're going to see it in oftentimes uh, more of an orange color, an orange against a white, but very detailed, lovely, um, a little bit more reserved, more feminine than the much more dramatic Satsuma pieces. Um, Kutani also has a very distinctive mark, right? And I talk about two Kutani wear on drlaurieview.com on the website. And many of the videos I've talked about Satsuma and Kutani. And there was something else that you said. Oh, cloisonne. Cloisonne is totally different. Cloisonne is a totally different thing from Satsuma porcelain vases, let's say, or Kutani porcelain dishes, right? Tea, tea sets and such. They're, they're different. Um, cloisonne is a different animal altogether, but also... Um, associated with China, Japan, and other parts of Asia. Good question, Maureen. Thank you. Good question. Thank you. Looks like oil, but a print in an old frame with a wooden stretcher. Yeah. Prints can, of course, have that where it looks like the piece is, in fact, it looks like the signature, not particularly an autograph. An autograph would be, oh, I have Babe Ruth autograph. A signature is uh, Rembrandt painted this painting and he signed his name, or Rembrandt printed this print and he signed his name. So a signature is different from an autograph. Makes sense. Autograph is somebody's autograph who's famous, right? And Rembrandt, while famous, is signing his work. So that's a different thing. And typically you're going to see them, an, a signature would be backwards or in the reverse uh, if, the print, if it's put onto the print in one way and then printed. You know, it's, it's the opposite. So that's great. Great. Sorry, eyelash. Does resizing an antique or vintage ring devalue it? Okay, this is a good question too, Brenda. There's a couple of things about, about this. First of all, um, sometimes when you resize a, a vintage ring, sometimes depending on where the mark is, like say you go from, you know, you go from an eight to a six, sometimes where the mark is, it will be actually, um, thank you, Maureen, it will be actually the mark might be lost when they resize it, when they size it down, okay? A lot of people will say, if I want to, if I want to wear this ring and I want to resize it, did I devalue the ring? 
right? Well, you usually, if you're going down in size, you're losing a little bit of the metal, right? So if it's 14 karat gold, you're losing a little bit of the value of the actual metal, but that's insignificant typically. Oftentimes, if you have a vintage piece and you want to resize it and you want to wear it for yourself, then typically the value is not significantly devalued if you resize it. Here's the thing about resizing or any time that you change any old piece of anything, the person who does that, re that resizing or that restoration or, or conservation has to do a good job. So it's always a good idea to ask for before and after pictures from these people. They have to do a good job because you've got one shot at this. And if they damage the ring somewhere, some other way, they're holding it in a vise and all of a sudden they've scratched the front part of the ring when they're trying to resize it, right? Uh, then you have a different problem. Now you have devalued it because you might have damaged it. So you have to make sure these people have a skill set and they also have experience dealing with and changing in some way, altering anything vintage, particularly jewelry. So you won't devalue it for that reason. But remember, if there's a mark on it, you might want to take a picture of the mark before. You definitely want to take a picture of the piece before you have anything rest restored or, of course, resized. But very good question. If you want to use it and you want to wear it, I can see where you say, hey, I want it resized because I want to put it on my hand. I can't wear it. Linda, I have a pencil sketch, large picture. That's an artist proof with an artist signature. Are artist proofs worth more? There's a couple of things. It depends on the artist proof. It depends on the artist as well. When you say worth more, are they worth more than the open edition prints by the same artist? Let me give you an example. Mark Chagall does a print of um, Dave, King David with the harp, right? So he does this print. And he makes, I don't know, 200, uh, 600, 6,500 of them. Makes a lot of them, right? That's called an open edition. And that's not the artist proof. That's not the one that he proofed for the printer and said, yes, the colors look good. Yes, go ahead, print them. That's an open edition. A lot of them out there, right? They're unsigned. The artist proof that he does, there's only one of them. He proofs only one. And he signs it. He puts AP or EA on it. Right. And I give you all I give you a list of all the different ways that all the different um, uh, letters, numbers and such that could be on a print. Right. HC, EA, AP, all these different things, plus fractions and what they mean. They're on the website, drlaurieV.com. Go to the search and put in prints and you're going to learn all of that. It's very important to know this. That's why I gave it to you. And it's all free on the website. All I have to do is put it in the search right above that contact button right there where the magnifying glass with the search. Put in prints and it's going to show you what AP means. Now, is it worth more than the open edition? An artist proof is a marketing idea that printers and artists came up with to basically say, oh, these are better because the artist actually touched it, looked at it, proofed it, and allowed the print and allowed the printer to go ahead and print more. So they can be more valuable. However, it depends on what you're comparing it to. So your sentence is, are artist proofs worth more? Worth more than what? Worth more than an open edition of the same print by the same artist? Typically, they could be marketed for more. Are they better? They're not always better, but a lot of people prefer an artist proof. Okay, so see how the market can be fickle. Thank you very much, Linda. I hope that answers your question. But there's a lot of information about prints and what you look for, what all of those different unusual little um, uh, initials mean when it's on a print. And some of them relate to, of course, uh, the European tradition of prints and others. But I want you to know that because that's really a treasure trove. That website of ours is a treasure trove of information, if I say so myself. Because <laughs> I want you guys to have that information so you can use it so you know what to avoid. You know, somebody asked me today in a video call, what does it mean if it's signed and then pencil signed? Well, that's called signed in the plate and pencil signed. So there are two different ways that an artist can sign a print. Prints are out there and they can be worth a lot of money. Some, some prints can be worth in, in close to a million dollars for one particular print. People go, oh, prints aren't worth anything. Well, it depends on the print, you know. Can a gold costume necklace sometimes be marked as such? Can a gold costume necklace sometimes be marked as such? Well, I don't know what you mean. <laughs> so... Can a gold costume necklace sometimes be not be marked as such? Oh, not be marked as gold costume? Not be marked as what? So you gotta gotta clarify that for me before I go off on some, you know, on walk some plank that that's not right. <laughs> so um, if they're not marked at all, 
Yeah, I, I got to understand your question better. I don't think I'm understanding your question. So be as clear as you can, even for me, right? Any suggestions on how to focus when using a loop? I'm having a lot of trouble. Brenda, the loop. Oh, I should have it in front of me. The loop is pretty simple, but it does take a little getting used to. Some of the things you have to do is basically move slowly toward your eye and, again, away from your eye. So the loop is relatively easy, but you have to get used to it, and it has to focus. If you wear contacts, contact lenses as I do, I don't have any trouble with contact lenses. If you wear reading glasses, sometimes you have to move the reading glasses a little bit. If you have progressives, some people have to move them. Some people don't. It depends. But moving it deliberately and slowly. Don't do this, you know. Deliberately and slowly looking through the loop. If you can't see it well one way, turn the loop the other way and go that way. Some people like to turn the light on and have it on all the time. Some people only like the light on because there's a light on the loop that we recommend through our specials and shop page where, yes, I get compensation if you buy a loop. But basically, um, with the light on, some people like the light off and then they put the light on differently. So you have to, you have to get used to it. If you're having a lot of trouble, that's basic. You shouldn't really be having a lot of trouble, but you have to go a little bit more slowly. Remember, the loop has two different lenses. So you may prefer one lens to the other, depending on how good or bad your eyes are, right? So I hope that helps. But the loop is going to open up your whole world to looking at so many different things. So many of you have told me that. Dr. Lori, I got the loop. I can't believe it. I'm seeing all this stuff I never saw. I now understand what I should be looking for, what I shouldn't be looking for. This is the information you can use, not just, oh, look, isn't this pretty? I'm thrifting. Great. That's great. But I want you to know what you should be looking for. Uh, you just described AP as BAT. The AP is one of the proofs given to the artist separate from the run. Okay. No, I didn't describe that. First of all, Eric, um, what I described was an artist proof based on her question right? So the AP is one of the proofs given to the artist separate from the run. That particular piece is usually, an AP is usually pulled out of the run. I've stood there next to the artist when they do this with printers. They pull it out. They say to the printer, here it is. This is the artist proof. And then usually the gallery dealer will market that piece. Now, there are also HC prints, which basically are those that are not allowed to be sold, but they've been proofed by the artist as well. Hans Commerce, which basically means not to be sold. Sometimes those are the prints that the artist feels is so good, they want it to go to a private collector, or they want it to go to their own collection, or they want it to stay within the estate, or they want it to go to a museum. So thank you very much for your comment, but I was answering that question. I appreciate your comment. Hi, Jeannie. Thank you very much for supporting the channel. A lot of you are new to all of this, and I'm very happy to have all of you. And I'm very grateful when all of you say, I mean, it's so sweet when all of you say I get, I get notes or I get an email or I'm on a video call or I'm somewhere out in the world. You come up to me and say, I've learned so much. I've learned so much. I'm doing so well. I'm very happy about that. I want you all to succeed. I know I can help you do it because I've helped many of you do it. I want to help more of you do it. So please spread the word. Is McCoy pottery valuable? You know, a lot of people like McCoy. McCoy is a very good American look. And I have to say that McCoy is, in fact, um, a type of pottery that a lot of people, of course, associate with the mid-century modern. It has more of sort of a country feel than a lot of other ones. McCoy is introduced, of course, in the early decades of the 20th century, but comes really of age, and we always associate it sort of with World War II era and post-war America. Um, cookie jars, um, McCoy planters, a nice glaze, pretty straightforward, nice heavy ceramic. Um, so yes, people do see a value in it and have been collecting it for a very long time. It doesn't have the same uh, staying power as a lot of others. Um, but because you're, you're seeing sort of like the Glidden pottery is kind of coming up um, and surpassing it. Um, you're seeing some of the other American potters of the, of the middle 20th century surpassing that some. But I think that McCoy is, of course, desirable. Um, some of their lines are really quite sweet. Yeah. yeah. So I would say that's a pretty good investment if you can get it inexpensively. I just made a hamburger, onion rings, and french fries. Well, that sounds delicious, John. When are you bringing over dinner? <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> I like to hear that. So onion rings, french fries. So do you have both? See, now, I would never be able to, to say, oh, I'm going to have onion rings and french fries. That's like, you know, that's like two bad things for me. But I hope you enjoy it, and it's delicious. It's delicious. 
Uh, what's the expert definition of a lithograph? Lithography is the process of, of course, using a stone and inking the stone and greasing the stone to then take the stone and impress it onto pieces of paper so you can, in, in fact, create a print. So lithography is introduced in the late 19th century. It's um, very, very popular by into the 20th century. We see color lithography. We see colotypes. We see lithography still being used today. So there's an expert definition of a lithograph. I hope that was helpful. Are ceramic carriage lamps with the horses worth anything? Um, I'd have to see which ones you're talking about. Um, and I have to say that this is a question that comes up a lot about, is this worth anything? Does that have value? Does this, have, everything has value. It just depends on if that value means something to you, right? So it might have low value. It might have, you know, high value. It just depends on what that means. You know, value to Oprah Winfrey, who's a multimillionaire is probably not the same kind of value that, you know, one of us would kind of say, oh, that's valuable. You know, she might say, that's not valuable you know, something that's really, really valuable to the rest of us. So it depends on, of course, um, the actual object. You can always send a picture to my website. And the website for sending, submitting photos um, is, of course, is drlaurieV.com. Right there on the homepage, it says send photos, get a report. And basically, it's a little camera. You click on it, and then I review it. I'm the one who reviews all of those submissions. People go, oh, it's your team. Oh, it's your this, it's your that. I review the submissions. I'm happy to review them and I'll tell you what I think and I'll tell you what your next step should be. Um, if it's not worth the cost of the appraisal, I'm going to tell you that. This is not worth it. Don't pursue this because it's not worth it. I don't, wanna, I don't want you to be pursuing something that's not worth the cost of the appraisal. So I tell you that right on the spot. Okay, Carmen, thank you very much. It's a very generous super sticker. I appreciate it. I know that this means that we're helping and that's what I like to hear. Thank you for, oh, you're welcome, Diana. Thank you for the question. I love the questions. I'm happy to answer any of the questions. So yeah, whatever it might be. If I can find some purple lipstick, I would, that's the question I want answered. Where is the good purple lipstick? I can't find purple. Everything's pink and red and this, anyway. I have a cinnabar bangle from a very wealthy state. Nice. Tanya could be worth, val could be valuable. Cinnabar bangle bracelet could be valuable. Yes. You know, a lot of people use that as a term. So if you're looking at cinnabar, here's what you look for. I want to see nice, strong carvings. I like to see Asian characters and I like to see nice, um, I like to see repeated forms. The bigger the bangle, the better. Um, if it has any kind of precious metals with it, even better. Uh, but looking for a list, if you're looking for cinnabar, I want to see um, textural carving. I want to see, um, usually I like, and then maybe that's just a personal preference, but when it comes to value, I've seen that more of them, when they have the Asian characters of happiness or good luck or something, they usually have a little bit more value. But cinnabar is very, very popular. People like it. It's good looking. Usually it dates early 20th century, and then it's revived again in like the 1960s, 1970s. So good for you. Good for you. A lot of people do that. I found an H Stern bracelet. Wow, that's great. I had another video caller I featured on Real Bargains, if you haven't seen it, who actually um, found in a, a lot, in like a box lot, in a small lot, or like a thrift store lot, uh, found an H Stern necklace with gemstones. I appraised it. She listed it, what I appraised it, and sold it. So you know what? H Stern, that's wonderful. I'd love to see it. Send in a picture. I'd love to see the H Stern bracelet that you found. I'd love to know how much you paid for it. Can vintage Barbie doll clothes? Yes, Kimberly. Good question. Vintage Barbie dolls. I just did a video with about vintage Barbie dolls. Um, vintage bar And a lot of people said, oh, no, those values are wrong. I do that all the time. These people don't know the market. It's just that simple. So basically a couple of different things. The clothes can be valuable. A lot of them, if you don't know, have a tag inside that is like the Barbie label, basically. So the Barbie label tag, um, those Barbie clothes can be valuable too individually. The accessories to her tennis racket, right? Her shoes, her sunglasses. Um, yeah, they can be. And so can the cases. Those wonderful cases. Thank you, Linda. Those wonderful cases of with Barbie, those vinyl cases. You know, you take your case and you go to your friend's house and you play with your Barbies, you know, and you try to make sure that you didn't mix, mix up her stuff with your stuff kind of thing. I liked her go-go boots. Remember the white go-go boots on Barbie? Barbie was fun. <laughs> what does CO mean on an oil painting? A couple of different things. First of all, you don't usually see a C and an O on an oil painting. Are you sure you have a CO, an oil painting? Are you sure you don't have an oleograph? 
Are you sure that you don't have a C with a copyright symbol? Is it a C with a circle around it? Is that what you mean by C-O? Because that's the copyright symbol. And a lot of you don't know that. Um, copyright symbol can be used on oil paintings, can appear also on prints. Um, and maybe it, you just didn't have the way to do it on your keyboard here, Eldwin. I don't know. But basically, in terms, I don't know about the keyboard. I do know about the painting. But the oil paintings usually are just signed, sometimes dated. Sometimes it'll say C for a copyright because the artist realizes that that particular painting is going to be licensed for production of prints of that same image. Because remember, artists retain the rights and the licensing to their images. So you're not allowed to just go off and you know take a painting and just reproduce it and, and just show it anywhere you want. There's actually rules against doing that with anything. Uh, so you have to be careful of all of that. Um, but yeah, if you mean a copyright, it's the C with the circle around it, which is introduced. On jewelry, it's in, it usually shows up for a design um, copyright after 1955. Will it hurt the value to wash vintage Barbie clothes? It depends. It depends. And here's why. Um, I know everybody likes everything to be clean and fine. It might be to your benefit to air them out rather than to put them into the agitator. Um, if you're going to hand wash them, you know, I want to make sure that you don't, of course, have anything, you know, if they bleed, if they stain. Uh, so be very careful before you do any of that. Um, so you could impact value negatively if you wash them and damage them. Thank you, Veronica, very much. I appreciate your support as well. Um, so you want to be careful before you wash anything. This is also true of quilts. You know, you want to be careful if you are, if you have an antique or vintage quilt and you said, oh, I'm going to just put that into the, into the, into the clothes washer and you have an agitator. So be careful of that. I have a quilt hand stitched from the twenties, speaking of quilts made by my great grandmother. Okay, great. It's in great condition. Is there any value? Definitely. Definitely. There's value, Brooke. You got it. Yep. Is there any value in buying and selling Pyrex? Definitely. Yes. There's value and they're and buying and selling Pyrex. And I've talked a lot about Pyrex on the videos. Have you ever used the binge link? You know, I've talked about it. I, I've done video calls about Pyrex. Um, there's an article about Pyrex. Yes, there's value in Pyrex. And there's value in corning. And there's value in a lot of those um, bakeware dishes. A lot of people are looking for particular patterns and lines and such. Um, if you're looking for Pyrex, you've got to look for the size of the dish. You've got to look for, does it have a lid? You've got to look for the different patterns or lines, right? Uh, design lines. Um, you have to also look for particular marks. Make sure there's no staining. Make sure there's no chips or cracks. There's your list for Pyrex. Is Hall kitchenware worth picking up to resell? It could be. There's, there's Hull art and then there's Hall kitchenware. They're two different manufacturers. Some people get them confused. But yes, you can do pretty well with these pieces. A lot of them are those pieces. Now, you know, if you've got to get them pretty low, though, right? So you've got to get them. Our rule, you know our rule, 10%, right? If something's worth 100, you don't want to pay more than 10 if you can, if you can help it. So if you see it, it's in good shape. It's a low value, you know, at the um, thrift store or such. Yeah, pick it up. We're getting through a lot of questions. This is great. Thank you for typing them in. Other questions? No questions for me. Let's see. No questions for me. I don't know. <laughs> Did you like the mud mask? That was fun. I have to do more of those things. They're fun. I love that stuff. I love makeup. I love makeup. I think it's fun. <laughs> and it's good to relax and do something fun every once in a while, right? And uh, I like to share it with all of you guys. And I like to hear what you guys are doing for, you know, relaxation or for fun. What's the most expensive piece of jewelry you've ever appraised? Hmm. Uh, I've appraised a couple of pieces of jewelry, which are confidential because they were done for insurance and by the rights for our clients. I cannot reveal that, but at an event, I'll tell you about a piece of jewelry that was really quite wonderful. It was a piece of jewelry that belonged to Queen Victoria of Great Britain and the, and of course the, the territories and colonies. Um, and she gave it to one of her ladies in waiting and a person brought it to, uh, one of my events. It was a harp shaped pin. And it had seed pearls in it. It was a gorgeous piece, and it was significantly valuable. I appraised also a wonderful, gorgeous, ah, like, I can't believe it's here. Uh, a very, very high, beyond six figures, uh, piece of diamond jewelry from the Gilded Age, the early 20th century in New York. 
um, a wonderful piece that was handed down the family. It was on the West Coast. They came to one of my events in Seattle, Washington. And uh, that piece was worth an awful lot. And it was diamonds galore. Not only big diamonds, but lots of diamonds. It was a beautiful piece. So how tall am I? I am five, six and a half. I'm five, six and a half. And I take the half. I like the half. My sisters are taller. My sisters are taller. Uh, I'm the shorty in the family. Are bisque dolls valuable? Yes. It depends on the maker. Uh, if you're looking for dolls, bisque dolls particularly, look for a couple of things. Look for size, right? The measurement from the bottom of the feet to the top of the head. Look for the wig, right? We want to have human hair wigs, nice human hair wigs uh, in good condition, not like the hair is all a mess, you know? So human hair wigs you want to look for. You want to look for a mark on the back of the neck, typically. You want to look for a plate that hits to about, you know, mid-chest, if you will, the shoulder plate. Uh, of the bisque doll. What else do you want? Um, you want to see typically bisque dolls to have, again, um, a nice strong body, right? Um, and you want to make sure that he that limbs are usually the same material as the head. Um, if you have, so the list of all of those things. And then don't forget glass eyes are helpful for value. Exposed teeth, right? Hand painted, eyebrows, lips, and such all impact value. I hope that list helped you. That was a big list of what you look for in bisque dolls. Um, usually the maker's mark is on the back of the neck or a mold number is on the back of the neck too. So yeah, great. Good question. Good question. Wonder why you want to know how tall I am because I'm always sitting down. <laughs> That's probably what it is. That's probably what it is. The questions are great and I appreciate them all. Thank you very much for your super chats and your super stickers too. And I hope these, of course, these opportunities to ask those questions that you just want an answer to, that you just don't know the answer, will be helpful to you. It's Italian chalkware, can Italian chalkware be valuable? A lot of people like and collect Italian chalkware. For those of you who don't know what chalkware is, it's a low-fired ceramic, and it looks sort of chalky if you look at it. Uh, chalkware got a bad rap at 1930s, 1940s fairs because chalkware was sort of given away if you, you know, threw the baseball at the bottles and, and won the game kind of thing. But Italian chalkware, a lot of people do collect. It's a little bit higher quality than the chalkware I just described that's more common in America. Um, sometimes painted, sometimes different figures. But chalkware can be valuable. It's not high, high in value. It's certainly not what porcelain or ceramics would be. <coughs> I see him talking. I'm sorry about that, folks. I'm talking too much. So, yes, Italian chalkware can be valuable. It will depend on the subject matter. What's the figure look like? It will matter on where it was made, who made it. It will matter on what kind of decoration it has and how old it is and what kind of condition it's in. So that will help you. And with that, I will wrap up because... I don't want to cough in your face anymore. I'm Dr. Lori, the PhD at Dix and Fraser. Thanks for being with me. Thanks for your questions and your support. I appreciate it. Use the binge link. It'll help you out. I'll see you next time. <clears throat>